Yeah, like a friend said to me the other day, it doesn't matter which part of the body you are as long as you're not there. Welcome back to the Ordinary Discussions Podcast. I'm your co-host, Aaron, and we have a very special guest with us today. Let me just tell you a little bit about our guest, Mike Breen. Mike is a highly respected leader, speaker, and author of in the Christian community. He's been involved in church leadership for over 30 years, has served as a pastor, a church planter, and a coach to leaders around the world. Mike is the founder of 3DM, a movement that focuses on equipping leaders and disciples to create missional communities. And he's authored several several books, of which uh, some of which we've been privileged to read, Building a Discipling Culture, uh, very close and near and dear to our hearts, Covenant and Kingdom and Family on Mission. His insights and teachings have had significant impact on the way many churches approach discipleship and mission. And we want to ask him more about that today. Gifted communicator and has a passion for equipping leaders. It's very contagious. So we are blessed to have him today. Uh, we're so thankful. But before we dive into that and introduce Mike, uh, just want to remind you guys to rate this podcast, share it with your friends so that other people can learn uh, about what we're doing here and uh, join this movement of Disciples Making Disciples. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to our host, Jeremy McCommons. Thanks, Aaron. Let's do this. Welcome, Mike. How are you? I'm good, thanks. I, I was amazed by that intro. It makes me a combination of something like Elijah and Archangel Gabriel. So uh, it's not even close to the reality. <laughs> well, there's a lot more to that, I think. Uh, I mean, <laughs> what, what else would you add to that? I mean, you once let No, I'm saying that we need to strip out most of it. That's the thing. No <laughs> way. I want people. I felt like I was holding back. I was holding back some nuggets. But... <laughs> yeah. So yeah. let's, 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 uh, let's embarrass you more. So you once led the largest church in, in the UK. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's incredible. Then you were hired by, what was the network to, to plant new churches? Um, yeah, we, uh, we worked with Leadership Network, and we created a thing called the European Church Planting Network. Yeah, and your and goal I, was to plant 500 churches, but you, I think you tripled that? Yeah, I think it was, uh, I think it was 1,400 in the end or something like that. 1,400 yeah. or something like that, yeah. Yeah, that's what Wikipedia says, and it's always right, so. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if Wikipedia says it, it must be right on. <laughs> well, anything else we should add? I know you're married, have some kids, right? Yeah, kids, grandkids. Uh, no great grandkids as yet. I'm not that old, but um, I'm very ancient and uh, just grateful that the Lord still found some things for me to do. So that's good. I didn't know you had such cool tattoos. Everything I've seen of you, you had long sleeve shirts on. Oh, right. right. That's yeah, awesome. I'm, 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 going into, I'm going into the shop. Um, in a couple of weeks to finish off this sleeve, which is sorry, I don't understand. Oh, this is my watch talking to me and saying, it doesn't <laughs> Is that um, your wife? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's the same idea. Uh, but the back of the um, the idea is that you know, the Renaissance religious art put biblical scenes into the landscape that they knew, into their own landscape, and so I'm going to put kind of symbols of the landscape of my life into the background of all these really scenes I've got in here mm. to kind of show that basically it's contextualization. I love that. So I just, I literally uh, like five days ago, no less maybe came back from Rome and, and, yeah. and Paris. And so I saw a lot of that in the, yeah. in the frescoes and yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an amazing thing. We, we think that we're the first people to contextualize the gospel. And you know, there's these painters who've got, the crucifixion, the baptism of Jesus. And, you know, in the background, it's got, you know, the churches in Florence. And you're thinking, wow, what? Eh? But of course, that's what they're tr saying is they're saying this is for now. This is for this is for everyday stuff. Yeah, I love that. that. I do, too. Yeah, it was it was fascinating. Uh, um, yeah, I, I, I could go on and on, but I won't I won't talk about my trip Roman Paris, there. brother. I mean, I'm, I imagine that did did you uh, did you manage not to have a car accident? We did because I didn't drive, so that's, ah, that's always yeah. that's always helpful. But I don't yeah. know how we avoided it with some of the taxi drivers in Rome. Man, oh, goodness wow. gracious! You just have to close your eyes and pray. I tell you, that's, yeah. it helps your prayer life. I guess it does for sure. Well, yeah. 
Aaron, we were just telling uh, Mike just what influence he's had on our lives without even knowing it. Um, many of you, uh, we just did a podcast. Actually, our last podcast was with uh, John Chandler, and Mike Breen has had a great wow. influence on uh, John's life. And and because of that, John has invested in Aaron and I. We've talked about that on the podcast and the podcast with John through a thing called Uptick. And then we did podcast a couple of years ago with John where we went through some life shapes. And so, Mike, oh, yeah. you created the life shapes, right? Yeah. Yeah, can yeah. you explain that? Like, how, why was that created? What is it? The whole, the whole, no. Um, well, there's a, there's different stories that, that kind of coalesce into the creation of, of life shapes. The, the first and most personal and most vulnerable part of the story is that as a dyslexic, I didn't read hardly at all until I was about 11. Hmm. Um, and then when I was around about 15, just coming up to 16, I began to really come under the conviction of the Holy Spirit about my life, about whether I knew God, about whether I needed to know God. And um, even either as I read the Bible or right before it, the, the thing that sometimes happens, and it's about 50% of dyslexics go through this compensating thing where your brain gets rewired. And um, basically my brain got rewired so that the first book I ever read was the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so a, a dyslexic brain is an interesting brain. If you ever read uh, David and Goliath uh, by Malcolm Gladwell, which is a great book that actually is, is helpful in that it gives a testimony of his own faith. There is this, there's this kind of recognition that the dyslexic brain is not a worse brain, but a different brain. You know, lots and lots of architects, lots of kind of creative thinkers, Einstein, people like that, had a dyslexic brain. And one of the things about a dyslexic brain, so Einstein, you know, on his way to work at the, uh, at the post office in Geneva, would imagine that the tram that he was on was on the end of a beam of light. And then he would imagine the universe in relation to that. Now, you know, obviously he's a clever bloke. <laughs> so he can do that kind of thing. But, but the way that my brain worked was that I began to try to find ways to organize the information that I felt people needed to know and to hang on to. And what I discovered pretty much by accident was that if you attach information to a geometric pattern, it's almost impossible to forget it. Hmm. Now, now recently neuroscientists have discovered that in fact, the reason for that is that that's the way that the brain organizes information around these geometric patterns and shapes. Exactly. And, um, and so I, I mean, it was, I mean, when I first started using this, people thought that I was, I mean, a combination of demonic or crazy. <laughs> and, um, and now everybody's kind of going, oh, yeah, that's very cool. And, uh, you know, doesn't everybody do that? Well, 30 years ago, I promise you they didn't. Hmm. But I just began to borrow a shape from here, try a shape from here. I mean, so, so Ken Blanchard's Leadership Square, which is based on, um, uh, you know, earlier work by anthropologists and behavioral scientists um they he, he kind of came up with this leadership square i took that away for about five years and thought it through from the perspective of the life of jesus and that became the leadership square for life shapes do you see what i mean so mm -hmm. it's it's cobbled together from lots of different sources and backgrounds and content but now it has this kind of coherence about it uh, that's taken many, many years to produce. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the funny thing is, is that I, I often see references to the shape and no recognition of the 10 generations of people that it's been through back to one of my books. I mean, I did a survey of how many church uh, websites use the idea of up in out in their vision 
you know, there's an upward dimension towards God. There's an inward dimension towards the church and there's an outward dimension towards the world. Mm -hmm. And it's about, it's about 75% of them. Well, they, they don't necessarily know where that all came from. It's just, you see what I mean? It's just, yes. yeah. It's just ubiquitous almost now. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so for those who, uh, who are listening and, and maybe have never seen any of that, like, could yeah. you just give a brief overview of maybe one of your favorite, you know, shapes or, or just something that would, that people can yeah. contextualize? Well, what, before before what... you start, Mike, let me just uh, promo your book. So this is the book we're talking about, mm -hmm. Building a Disciple Culture. Excellent book. This is the third edition, I think. And mm -hmm. um, so all the shapes are in here if you want to know more. And we also did those podcasts with John Chandler on the shapes. And we did the semicircle, we did the circle, and we did the discipleship square. And so, yeah. uh, but, and we'll put those in the link below if you want to hear more about it. But th this is Mike's uh, brainchild. I mean, this is, this is from him. So this is amazing <laughs> that you're on this podcast talking to you about, talking to us about it. You're all too kind. Um, so just, to, just as a, a kind of precursor to this, Warren Wearsby, who is probably the most underrated New Testament scholar ever, he's an amazing New Testament scholar, Warren Wearsby defined the parables of Jesus in the most comprehensive way. He said, every parable of Jesus does three things. It gives you a picture of God, a mirror on yourself, and a window on the world. So it's a picture of God a mirror on yourself and a window on the world. Every life shape is a parable. Mm. So if you take the triangle, the triangle obviously got three sides, three corners. Each of the corners indicates the three dimensions of the life of Jesus. Jesus lived in constant union with the father in constant attention for his given community, the disciples and constantly attending to the needs of the lost, who he came to seek and to save. So the triangle, there it is, very simple, up in out, is a picture of God because it reveals the life of Jesus in three dimensions. But then when I look at the triangle, I can say, okay, what area of the life of Jesus do I need to attend to? Is it my relationship with God? Is it my relationship with other disciples or is it my relationship with pre-Christians? Where do I feel the weaknesses right now? Where do I feel the strength is? So it gives me a mirror on myself. And then I can take it and say, okay, well, if I look at my house group, if I look at my missional community, if I look at my church, how can I use this as an analytical tool to help me understand where our weaknesses are collectively our strengths are collectively because it gives me a window on the world. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. So, so there's just a very brief introduction to one of the shapes and the, and the way that the shapes work. Mm -hmm. Aaron, what would you say you're the shape that spoke to you the most? I mean, like I need to like, like you see, as he was saying, Hey, like these shapes, you know, some people take these shapes and, and it helps you to kind of remember, like, I need to dive back into some of it because even as he's talking about that, I'm like, Oh, where am I deficient in that? And so to yeah. me, that's like life giving just to hear the application of that triangle because I'm like, oh, like I've spent even this week time going, God, where do you want me? Like having to kind of be spirit led and be like, <clears throat> yeah, I, I feel this is, this is pulling on me in this direction. This is pulling me in this direction. This is pulling me in this direction. And I think going back to basics in some of these shapes will help somebody like me that's feeling pulled in those directions, but wants to follow the spirit, you know, in each of those yeah. areas of life, um, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm not the expert on it, but I need to continue to, to. So you see what you're it. saying there, what you're saying there, Aaron, is something that I think is enormously important because what you're saying, I think every person and particularly every person of your generation that I encounter seems to be communicating to me. And that is, they are at minimum curious and at maximum compelled to understand what it is that God's saying to them. <laughs> so the, the two questions of discipleship that Jesus identifies as being the basis of, of discipleship are, what is God saying to me? What am I going to do about it? 
So he does the whole Sermon on the Mount, the most amazing kind of presentation of the kingdom any time in history. And in that amazing sermon, he finishes with the parable of the wise and foolish builder. And the foolish builder actually hears what Jesus says. The foolish builder just doesn't put it into practice. The wise builder is the one who hears his words and puts them into practice. So, so being a curious person, a person that's compelled to listen, means that you want to be a builder. You, you want to build something. The question is, what kind of thing are you going to build? And the, the real difference is, when you hear it, are you going to put it into practice? Because that's the difference between the wise and foolish builder. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's so interesting about what you just said there is that that's absolutely the very heart of discipleship. Mm -hmm. Absolutely the very heart of discipleship. Mm -hmm. What's God saying to me? What am I going to do about it? You ever heard that phrase before, Aaron? What's that? What's God <laughs> saying to you? What are you going to do about it? <laughs> Multiple times. Yeah, John would use that at the end of every uptick session. Um, yeah, yeah. And I'm and we we use it some too. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be integral in the in the new uh, small group cohorts that we're going to use. Is we're going to end everyone with that with that question. I get, oh. you have influences way more than than you know. And I'll say. Well, first of all, I'll just say that the semicircle was so valuable to me at the season of yeah. life that I learned it because I was coming out of being an entrepreneur and trying to get find this place of from just burnout to a yeah. place of enjoying rest. And, and every time, and we did a podcast on this, it'll be linked below if you guys want to go back and listen to it. But every time I would find rest and I would do something for myself, I would feel guilty that I was mm -hmm. cheating this area, right? And is that and, a pendulum, Jeremy? Yeah, it was yeah, a pendulum, right? yeah. 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 And, and inst Instead, I was trying to balance, which is impossible to do. Uh, and I was yeah. trying to live a life of balance versus a life of rhythm. And man, I, I just can't tell you. And seeing that pendulum, like you said, the shape, it, 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 yeah. it is so visual for me. And uh, to see, okay, I'm a season of rest. Okay, now I'm in a season of work. It's okay yeah. to cheat rest during work, and it's okay to, to an extent. I don't want to put words in your mouth, yeah. but, but there's always yeah. a season of rest. But but I'm but I'm talking like a deep rest. So, but anyhow, it gave me this. Uh, I could release this guilt and shame that I would have when I was resting versus when I was working, and the whole nine yards. So, uh, just powerful yeah, I mean, stuff. Yeah, and of course, the semicircle is the is the arc that the that the pendulum creates when it's left to its own devices. Mm -hmm. I mean, the thing about the, the semicircle that I've often found really quite instructive is when you, so think of, the, think of a pendulum swinging through the arc of a semicircle. When it gets to the end of that arc, just before it starts the journey in the other direction, it's weightless. Mm. And the thing that I've noticed is this. There is this moment when you're in the midst of work, when if you if you just attend to yourself, you'll begin to feel like, wait a minute. I think I might just be pushing the envelope a bit too far here. I might just be in the, po in the process here of just pushing this into the territory, not of burnout, but of kind of maybe singeing Maybe there's a vague smell of burning in the in the distance. So there's that there's that feeling of almost weightlessness. You know, you you're you're working and you if you just give yourself a moment, just as you put your head on the pillow at night, you go, I don't know, I think I'm pushing this a bit. And the same thing's true of rest. Yeah. You get to the end of the rest period and you say, I'm just at the point here of recovery. And if I go beyond this, it's going to be laziness. Yeah. And that that mm -hmm. That you know what I mean. That moment is the thing to be looking for. How can I, how can I calibrate my internal awareness to be conscious of that weightless moment that says, "No, I need to surrender to the to the process of going back the other direction." Mm -hmm. So if I'm resting, I'm going to allow the spirit to take me back into the into the process of being productive and fruitful. If I'm working. I'm going to allow the spirit to take me back into rest, even if I want to do another hour, another two hours work. Mm -hmm. did, did, did the shapes come first and then that was applied to the church 
building movement or did it come kind of in the midst of like, did it kind of come together where it was like, yeah, it was very was kind of ad hoc. Yeah. It was very ad hoc to be honest. It, the first one that was, was developed was the circle. The second one was the square. The third one was the triangle. The fourth one was the semicircle. Uh, the fifth one was the Pentagon. So, you know, they kind of came in a randomized order and they came very much as I was involved in mission and trying to find ways in a post-literate culture for people to engage with the Bible, even though, I mean, they just didn't read anything. Mm -hmm. So nobody ever read anything in those days. I mean, th this is a days before when people had phones that they'd be reading content on all the time, they, they just, they just were in a kind of a post -lit literate state. And so how do you get people to remember the Bible? You know, how do you get people to remember scripture? Well, I really, this is what I kind of stumbled upon. Fascinating. Hey, I have to say, go back to that, that what you mentioned, the weightlessness, the the, the yeah. smell of of singe, yeah. the the verge <laughs> of laziness. Um, yeah. I I just want to say this because it was an it's an answer to prayer. Literally this morning in my prayer time, I was praying, like Lord, teach me how to know, teach me how to know when I'm when I'm, because I because I still get this this feeling at times when I when I spend too much time for myself that maybe I'm being selfish or being lazy, right? Yeah, yeah. And then and then I go to the work side, and then it's like, oh man, I went too far. And sure. so I really feel like it was an answer, like this conversation we're having right now. I know it may sound silly to people listening, but I mean, I was, I mean, four hours ago, I was praying about this very thing. And what you said is so practical for me. It's mm -hmm. like when, cause I can tell when it's starting to feel like laziness. I can tell when it's starting to feel like burnout yeah. and it's just like being very attuned to those areas and then listening to the Lord and his prompting at that moment. And so yeah. thank and you again, for that. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. You're welcome, Jeremy. And again, it's, it's this thing, you know, God created us to communicate with him. And it's no secret. Everybody knows this. Human communication is 70% nonverbal. So if, if all human communication, and it doesn't matter how many tests you do on it, it's somewhere between 70 and 80% is nonverbal. Mm. So if that's the case, then we have to assume that we've been created by God to communicate with him most of the communication that he has with us is nonverbal. And most of the communication to him that we call prayer is nonverbal. And so we have to learn how to pick up what it is he's saying to us through the instrument of our body and our mind. And so what I'm saying to you is, I think everybody can begin to feel that feeling of weightlessness. And you kind of go, wait a minute, I think I know what this is feeling like. I can feel it in my body. I can feel it in my mind. This is God saying something to me. I need to attend to it. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And being, and then over time, like recognizing yeah. his voice in those moments. I recognize this from, from last time and be able to kind of adjust, adjust from there. That's exactly it. Yeah. That's exactly it, Aaron. Yeah. So Mike, you are like, uh, in my mind, the, like the grandfather of like discipleship, because because it was more, it was kind of introduced to me through a lot of your concepts and books, and uh, yeah. so I'm an I'm an understudy. Tell me in your own words, how would you define disciple and discipleship? Because I'll tell you, I think it's hard to find a definition. Uh, you, I read discipleship books, and they don't ever define it, really. They talk around it, but, but I'd love to hear what you think the definition is in your eyes. Yeah, I mean, the simplest, the simplest definition of disciple is the word itself, which we translate into English as disciple, but the simplest translation is learner. Mm -hmm. And so... When Jesus sends out his 12 disciples, he says, go into all the world and make them learners, baptize them and teach them everything I've taught you. Hmm. So that kind of you go, oh, OK, well, I think I know what disciple is now then. So what we're doing is we're saying we're committed to a lifelong journey of learning from Jesus of how to live his life. 
and we're in a lifelong journey of helping others be formed into that same kind of life and that's what it means to make disciples so so being a disciple means that i'm learning from jesus every day i'm following him every day i'm i'm trying to understand what he's saying to me and apply that to my life and i'm helping other people to do the same thing awesome so you say, uh, I've heard you say, I think in your books, and I've heard on some other podcasts I've listened to of you, yeah. that discipleship is much more than information, it's imitation. Am I, am I right in saying that? Uh, yeah, it, can, can you explain that? What, what do you mean by yeah, that? Yeah, so the first disciple in the world was not Andrew or Peter, but was Jesus. So it's really important that we get this, because... What Jesus was doing with his disciples was helping them to do the thing that he was doing. And he tells us what he's doing in John chapter 5, verse 19. He says, I only do what I see the Father doing. Mm -hmm. I only say what I hear the Father saying. So he's saying, yes, it is information, but it's also imitation. But because it's me that's doing it, it's innovation. So the three components of discipleship are information, imitation, and innovation. It has to be innovation because all of us are different. So we have to innovate what it is that we're imitating to make it our own. Yeah. That's great. Uh, Aaron, do you I, see uh, that? Do you see that in ordinary movement? I mean, we are literally taking the yeah. information. Uh, we're imitating what Mike has has spelled out, and now we're innovating, and we're we're pretty much yeah. taking what he did and tweaked it a little bit into our context, right? Yeah, well, I think it I think it also it's displayed on the individual level from a from a gifting perspective, right? Yeah. And a, almost like a parts of the parts of the body um, yeah. reference where yeah. not everyone's called to be this or that, but so like, but we all serve the same God, the same yeah. Jesus. We're all looking at the same example. Yeah, it's like a friend filter. said to me the other day, it doesn't yeah. matter which part of the body you are as long as you're not the asshole. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that I even has a point, right? I think, <laughs> I, think I think that's tweetable. I don't know about you, but I think that's awful. <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you get really theological, I mean, that still has a lot of value. <laughs> of course. Isn't that, in, isn't that in 1 Corinthians 12 somewhere? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. That's so great. That well, great. So on that, <laughs> so on the imitation piece, you know, one thing I feel like we miss as as disciple makers is we we teach the word and we and and, and that's all great. I mean, the Bible is is the word of God. Uh, it's God breathed. Yeah. But sometimes we get so caught up in just teaching that we forget about uh, Im- imitating His life. Um, yeah. and so there's a new, there's a new ministry. It's called practicing the way. I don't know if you've heard of it. Uh, John Mark it's Comer. Great. It's a great name. Uh, it's John Mark Comer. Uh, he wrote the book, uh, the ruthless elimination of hurry. He's great, great speaker. Pastor. I love him. I love his books. They're great. Yeah, they really are. And so practicing the way is all about, okay, we, we follow the word of God, the, the commandments and, and, and such. Um, but what about following the lifestyle of Jesus? And it's a lot of what you teach about in your in your life shapes, which is this rhythm of rest, right? It's taking Sabbath, it's it's rest, it's it's tithing, it's uh, all, all these um, fasting, all these ways that uh, Jesus walked. That sometimes as disciples we get so caught up in commandments and we forget that we also need to walk like Him. Would you say yeah. that's a lot of this imitation piece, or am I missing that? No, I think that's exactly it, and it's really interesting to me that. The first name given to the church before even the name Christian was given to the church is the way. Hmm. You're right. <laughs> so, so, you know, it's, it's understood to be that there's a group of people in community following in the way of Jesus. Hmm. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. And, um, you know, Alliteration obviously means that it's truly revealed by God. <laughs> so, uh, so I I often say to people, if we're going to follow Jesus, we have to follow Him in His words, in His works, and in His ways. Yeah. It's no good saying, 
you know, we're going to teach about the kingdom and then not pray for the sick. That's fool. I mean, that, that means that you're not doing the works of Jesus. Yeah. And I'm not suggesting that we have to necessarily be that successful, but we just have to give it a go. And, um, and so words and works and then the way of Jesus. How did he do stuff? I mean, he, he, did, he did stuff in such a different way to everybody else. Mm-hmm. You know, the woman caught in adultery. I don't know any church that I've encountered that would have dealt with that woman in that way. Yeah. You know, it's just in a public setting like that, it's like, wow, that's a wholly different way of doing stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I have a, I have a hint. Well, we've even had some pastors on the on the podcast, mm. just speaking of ch- churches and younger yeah. pastors, pastors with their their ministry kind of starting to to take off. And yeah, we talk about discipleship in the church a lot. Um, I think you you've said before, if you make disciples, you always get the church. But if you make the yeah. church, you rarely get the disciples. Mm-hmm. And I think um, if you could kind of speak to that a little bit, I think that would be helpful for some of you know, for some of these young yeah, pastors I mean, that are getting started. I think it's real. I think it's such an important thing that because the, the, the model that we follow is generally a kind of commoditized corporate model where we, we've made Christianity a commodity and then we create a corporate kind of reality that, that makes it possible to deliver that commodity. Mm-hmm. And Generally, we call that the Western church. And generally what it does is produce people who consume the commodity that we have packaged for them. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, you know, if that's what you want, that's fine, except two problems with it. One is that Jesus said he was going to build the church. So it's obviously not our job. And secondly, he didn't give that as the task for the disciples in the Great Commission. He just told them to make disciples. Mm -hmm. And actually, what that means is that the cause is discipleship and the effect is the church, not the other way around. We don't make the church the cause and the effect discipleship. We make the cause discipleship and then you get the church. Yeah, I believe that. So, So that's just... And I think that the church would be a lot simpler, a lot lighter weight, a lot lower maintenance if we approached it from that way around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, um, I'm i fired up about that. Like, I feel like God's kind of connected me to ordinary movement and he's stirring up in me from a smaller group perspective, like what yeah. discipleship is. I have yeah. even a smaller group that kind of like resembled that. And then now it's like, what does discipleship look in a larger group. And then how do I bring that to, to my church, the bigger C and then overall, like, you know, you've experienced success with churches and growth. And, and so what do you feel like gets in the way of that? And how do you make adjustments to, to make sure that, that we're looking at discipleship in this way and, um, and allowing for the growth that, that can happen? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the two big, the two big questions are, are we developing things for others to consume or are we developing people to produce something? So are they consumers or producers? That's, that's the big question. The first big question. And then the second big question is, are, are people coming to me for me to deliver to them religious goods and services? Or are we coming together as equals believing that there's no spiritual hierarchy. You see, I've coined this phrase, spiritual feudalism, which indicates to me what we see in a lot of churches, which is that we have this unspoken spiritual hierarchy of people who are there to feed the flock and who are there to provide for the flock. But it's very hard to argue that from scripture as a, as a category of people. The way that scripture seems to indicate is that everybody's doing the work and therefore everybody is contributing to the strengthening, the growing and the provision 
uh, of the people of God. And so this this unspoken hierarchy, you know, obviously this hierarchy in things like uh, liturgical traditions, like the Catholics and the Anglicans, the kinds of traditions that I came out of. But there's there's the same kinds of hierarchies in churches where the pastor is six feet above contradiction, where <laughs> the pastor is the anointed man of God. I mean, I'm I'm okay, I guess, with those kinds of things, but I just don't see it defended in the New Testament. And the real issue is this. It creates a separation within the people of God that mean that there is a group of people that are providers and a group of people that are clients. Mm -hmm. That client and provider relationship is always going to be a problem. And so it's and it's always going to be a problem of growth. Because if the if the providers are a small group of people and the clients are a large group of people, I don't know how you multiply that. It just does it. It's not a multipliable model. Yes. If there's only one person, like, yeah, it's not a scalable model. You can't. And in business, too, I mean, it's the same thing. Um, yeah. And I think a lot of, I think a lot of pastors maybe kind of ride that out until you get to a place where the church dissolves or split, or, you know, what do you do at the end of that road when, the, when you, right. when you finish your, your leg? So, so, did did you build some of that in with the churches that you were helping to plant? Like, yes. What does that What does that look like to build in the opportunity for others to serve and lead and make room for that lifetime or that lifespan? Basically, yeah. I mean, the the, the basic way is to say to everybody that everybody looks like a sheep from the front and a shepherd from behind. Mm -hmm. So everybody is looking to somebody else for some form of example and everybody in the world has somebody else who's looking to them and being more intentional about that being more aware of that more mindful of that means that instead of thinking that there's a group of people that are called leaders and a group of people that are called followers actually we're all in the same same place so that mm -hmm that kind of democratization of discipleship means that we're all in the same process. Mike, I just got a, a it's less a, it's not really a pushback. It's a question, but you said the new Testament yeah. doesn't really, yeah. you can't find in the new Testament where it uh, explains this whole, uh, you know, man up top feeding everyone. Yeah. And, and I, yeah. I would agree with that, but how do yeah. you, um, because, because I, I see it as, there is someone there to teach and, and feed, but it's it's so that the, the the body of Christ can do the work of ministry. Like we're all supposed to be doing the work of ministry. And I get that from Ephesians. So like in Ephesians 4.11, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the protecting yeah. perfecting of the saints. So how would you reconcile that um, with what you just said? Yeah, the key word is the, is the word some. Hmm. So it's, it's some of what? So verses 1 to 7 are all about the unity of the church. So it's one God, one Father, one baptism, one church. One, 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 all the way through to verse 7. And then in 7, it says, basically, in the unity, there is a fundamental diversity. And so... My interpretation of that passage, which when I first uh, shared this, you know, 30 something years ago, again, pitchforks and torches were being brought into the church. This day and age, lots and lots of scholars agree with me that actually what the passage is saying is the unity is the body of Christ and the diversity is the ministry of Jesus. And the whole body of Christ gets to do all of the ministry of Jesus. And so everybody is one of the five. So within the, the one, some are pastors, some are teachers, some are evangelists, some are prophets, some are apostles. And what that does is it begins to change our paradigm of what it is that we're talking about, because the passage is not talking about leadership. 
In fact, there's no mention of leader in the by in, in the whole passage. It's only talking about the membership of the people of God in the body of Christ. So everybody who's a, a follower of Christ is the, in the body of Christ, and the whole body of Christ gets to do the whole ministry of Christ. So now what equipping means is something along the lines of imitation. So here am I. Say I'm, say I'm an apostolic person. What I do in the body is not make everybody else an apostle, but help everybody else understand what it means to be a sent people. If I'm an evangelist, I'm not helping everyone to be an evangelist. I'm helping everyone to be a witness. Some of us are evangelists. Everyone's supposed to be a witness. If I'm a pastor, I'm not supposed to make everyone a pastor, but I'm supposed to help everyone care for one another and love the brothers and sisters as Jesus love does. Likewise, with all of the other things, prophet, helping people to listen to God, teacher, helping people be reliant upon the word of God. So what we're doing now is we are interacting with each other. And of course, there'll be different levels of gifting within each of those within each of those five fold ministries. There'll be different degrees of experience, different degrees of maturity. But we're in the ministry of Jesus together because we're in the body of Christ. Yeah. And so it's not about leaders and followers where leaders are equipping everybody else. It's about the body of Christ being equipped by grace to equip one another. And uh, we just have to find new ways of doing that. I'm not suggesting that it's a simple matter. I'm saying it's different. There's a different complexity than the one that we currently have. So is the current church model, I mean, can, can we even, can we make missional movements of disciple making in the church current model or does it have to be rethought i i think we constantly have to keep thinking i think we have to keep reimagining and particularly you know like for this this particular passage where we just looked at if you look at the passage and you say okay i'm going to assume that it's not about leaders but it's about everybody then i have to start thinking okay so how do we do this then? And, and, and then what you do is you say, well, obviously I need to now see what the rest of the scriptures are saying uh, about the way in which the Holy Spirit works and how it is that that occurs in meetings and how it occurs in movements. And, and by doing that, we begin to, if you like, reconstruct or reimagine what the church might be like and then begin to apply it into the practicalities. So one practicality would be that we get people to do not a questionnaire of their spiritual gifts, but a questionnaire that helps them identify which of the fivefold ministries is the base ministry of their life that God's given them grace for, and then learn how to receive from the other ministries so that they can grow into the full measure of the stature of Christ, which means not doing all of the other ministries, but capable of receiving from the other ministries so that you're able to do the things that the other ministries do. Witness, listen to God, care for other people, stand on the word, be on mission. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, for sure. And what that does is it creates an entirely different and really quite exciting dynamic. Mm -hmm. yeah, no and maybe doubt. from the beginning, like having that mindset going in from the beginning say you're just attending a church for the first time and it's like there's no there's no like sideline christians here there's no it's not a spectator yeah. situation like where where are you gifted where is god calling you let's figure out how you can fulfill that in that calling in your life totally um, so so you know so like every sunday we have people forward to respond to what it is that god's saying to them during the worship and word and i say i say every time now there's a prayer team here but they're not particular. They're not special. Their job is to pray for people, but actually their other job is to go and recruit people from the congregation to come and help them pray. That's right. Mm -hmm. So, so that's even in that little tiny thing, we're saying the same thing over and over. Do you see what I mean? Yes, that's huge. Why do you think? Maybe I'm. Um, I don't know. My perception is. I wouldn't say. I'm not saying all pastors, right? I'm not going to oh, say yeah. that, but. 
and maybe you disagree with the statement, but why or a question, but why do you think so many pastors are afraid of of this type of a church model where it's it's really like we're all it's like we're to, we're not creating consumers, we're creating disciples that go out and do, and we're all doing it together. What well, maybe it's a perception I have that a lot of pastors are scared of it. Why do you what do you agree with that? Base level, and I, I'm not criticizing anybody for this. I'm just saying it's honest, and this is honest thing in me as well. You do what you're trained for. You you do what you're affirmed in, and you do what you're paid for. Mm-hmm. If you don't do it, then you don't get paid, you don't get affirmed, and your training was a waste of time. So, you know, you're thinking, hang on a minute. So what is it I just committed my life to? And um, I I can't tell you, I cannot tell you how many hundreds of pastors, male and female, have pulled me to one side and said, honestly, Mm. I never got taught any of this at college. And I wonder what on earth it was I was doing there. Yeah. Mm. You must have heard the same thing. Yeah, well, I've heard a quote that says, it's hard to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon him not. <laughs> yeah, there and, you go. And I'm human just like anyone else. Like, I, I get it. You got mortgages to pay. You got you got kids to put through college. And it's your job. Yeah. But, it, you know, I, I totally get that. I understand that. But it's, you know, it, yeah. that doesn't mean that it's the right way to do it. I agree. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Aaron, you had a question? Yeah, Mike, I wanted to share with you one of my one of my favorite things that we we talk about and and OM and OW participants yeah. will will know about this too. Uh, we talk a lot about high challenge and high grace. And I was yeah. reminded that that concept, which is just one of my favorites, you know, <laughs> in, in how to approach yeah, you know, yeah. discipleship and, and interaction with with one another in our groups, yeah. um, that that actually came from from your book. Yeah. And so I wanted to share with, with you that, and then actually have you kind of unpack that a little bit um, of where that came from and, and how, how that ended. Yeah. Ended I mean, there. I mean, the, the, the baseline is, is invitation and challenge. Um, but of course, all of that is folded into grace. And, you know, when you, again, we use Jesus hermeneutic, we say Jesus is the interpretive key to everything in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And so we understand that the big theological concepts of the Bible are built around the invitation to relationship and the challenge to represent God Mm -hmm. out of that relationship to represent him. So when you're representing God, you, you, you can easily end up in a performance mentality. And so you need a lot of grace to remove that performance mentality that would get you just down a religious track. Mm -hmm. So invitation and challenge, Jesus begins his ministry by an invitation, come follow me. He completes his ministry with a challenge, go into all the world. It's quite clear that within those bookends of invitation and challenge, come and go, there's a constant calibration of invitation and challenge, both of which are, if you like, supported with the texture of grace. So you're invited through grace and you're challenged in grace. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's our, one of our main cultural values is, 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 that, really? is that very high challenge, high grace piece, because I think we've lost so much. Like, I think we're so far on the grace side of things that we forget we can bring challenge around our faith. Sure. And, uh, and I think men and women actually thrive in high challenge environments. As long as grace, I, I mean, as you would say, that's the quadrant where people thrive. Um, yeah. As long as grace is attached. Yeah. And as long as it's, as long as there's nothing that's telling them that their value is dependent upon the performance, you, you're going to try and you, sure you'll fail. So, but you're taking on the challenge to represent. Mm-hmm. That's the point. Yeah. That's and, good. Uh, and representing God means that you've got to have a relationship with him. And out of that relationship, you get all the grace that's needed. Yeah. Well, we're going to land the plane here uh, for, for your time. Uh, Mike, but I have an hour already. Uh, You're we're, far too interesting. Yeah, well, no, yeah, we are far too interesting. Far too interesting. Uh, we're at fifty minutes, I think. But so, so you may or may not know, but ordinary movement, ordinary men, ordinary women—the subcategories of it—we exist to make disciples and make disciples. Uh, we want to resource, we want to encourage, we want to train, we want to disciple ordinary people 
uh, in their own, in order to walk out discipleship in their own sphere, right? Because we believe that God has called the ordinary all throughout history. It's like rarely the highly schooled, the highly trained, the highly learned, uh, not the perfect people because they don't exist, but these yeah. messed up ordinary people. And I think we've we've marginalized the ordinary in, in in today's society to think that they have to be on the sidelines. You know, you can only come and consume. And so, yeah. what God's put on our heart is to ignite these people. So, I would ask you. What can you say, because that's what our listenership is. A lot of these people listening today are going to be these people. It's going to be like Aaron and I, just just these ordinary guys yeah. that are trying to do it, right? And yeah, women yeah. that are trying to do it. So what would you say to those people uh, to encourage them in their pursuit, even though they don't have a seminary degree and they don't have any Bible school education? Um, uh, do you feel like that? Like, like, does that discount them? Does that, does that motivate you to encourage? I mean, what, what, what does that look like to you? So here's, here's what I would say. And somebody just gave this as a, a verse at our prayer meeting last night at, uh, at the church that I serve at. They, uh, they gave Philemon v- verse six, which was be active in sharing your faith so that you can have a more complete understanding of the goodness we have in Christ. Hmm. And that's it, basically. That, that word understanding is not about intellectual knowledge. It's about experiential knowledge that, quite honestly, it doesn't matter how many degrees you've got or how many verses of the Bible that you can memorize. It's about living your life in a way that is generous and curious and kind so that you're sharing who you are. And in the sharing of that, you're actually learning what it means to understand the goodness of Christ. We encounter the goodness of Christ. Paul says we're created in Christ Jesus for good works that we that we will discover along the way that he has that he has stored up in advance for us. So it's as we continue in the way that we come across all these things that he's made for us. So all I would say is that the average person who's trying to kind of work it out as they go, they're the people that Jesus is wanting to reveal more of himself to. Yeah, I agree. I love that. Well, man, this is great. I, I honestly, I, I can't imagine uh, an hour of my time that I would rather have spent elsewhere. Uh, this is for me. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. But before we leave, I just want you—you you provide resourcing on your website. You do coaching, mm-hmm. counseling, or not counseling, but coaching, consulting. Um, yeah. Can you explain what you offer and how people can reach you if they would like to? Yeah. So if you go to 3DM Publishing, you'll see all the books and the resources that are available there. And if you go to uh, to Mike James Breen, you'll see the kinds of things that I offer. And I, I, I mean, one of the things I'm doing right now is working with a, a company that's run by Christians and helping them to develop a culture of the five capitals. Mm. Fascinating that they want a they want a culture in their business of the five capitals. Um, I work with other people, helping them with their churches or with their movements or whatever. And uh, and really what I love the most is being in a situation where people are asking the questions that force me to, if you like, excavate my experience and my, my knowledge, mm-hmm. which has been gained over decades, rather than being in a situation where people say to me, well, just come and talk to us about anything you want to talk to us about. I much prefer to be in that more kind of rabbinical situation where people ask me questions and I have to think about what the answer is. Yeah. And um, that's, uh, that's the kind of thing that I do a lot these days. It's amazing. Yeah. You may be spending some time with us in the future. Cause I I'm, I'm pretty certain as we grow <laughs> that it's, it's going to quickly outgrow my ability to, uh, well, that'll be fun. I'll enjoy that. Yeah. I, I tell you one of the things that was fun for me, I was in Uganda and they said, well, we've done all your stuff, Mike. And I said, that's amazing. How's it going? And they said, well, we're doing okay. Uh, there's 21,000 people in missional communities, um, not including the young people. <laughs> <laughs> And there's another 20,000 teenagers in their missional communities. I'm like, are you kidding me? Wow. wow. <laughs> that is amazing. Isn't that amazing? Cool. That is. Praise God. 
Well, uh, we'd like to end uh, with asking our guests uh, uh, some questions, fun questions, just to oh. just to see what you would say. So if you yeah. if you don't mind, I'll ask you our three questions. Yeah. The first one is if you could travel, time travel anywhere or any when, where would you go and why? You can't say Jesus. But that's always the rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't say Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, that's a really, that's a great question. I think, um, I think, the the world of the new testament is a fascinating world and i'd love to go to some of those great cities that some of the early leaders went to like paul i'd love to go to ancient ephesus i've been to contemporary ephesus and it's nothing of course like what it was then it'd be fun to go and see those worlds and to try to breathe it in it's a bit like when you do the holy land tour you know and you kind yeah. of get in the footsteps mm -hmm. of jesus I'd love to actually do the real thing and go to those places. That would be a fun thing to do. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, I agree. Uh, second question is if you can only eat one thing, the rest of your life, what are you choosing? Eggs. Eggs. <laughs> Eggs. So because I'm, Eggs. I'm a very active person and I just need lots of protein. So I can make an egg in like 20 different ways. So <laughs> probably an egg. that's great. Uh, and the last one, if you could give younger you one piece of advice, what would it be? Don't be an asshole. <laughs> you can be any member of the body of Christ, but don't be the asshole. <laughs> I love it. That's, that's the quote. That's, put, that on, put that on the t-shirt. That'll be our title for the podcast. We get a bunch of, a bunch of, uh, stiff neck Christians all like, what? They curse. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah, that'd be great. Mike, thank you so much. You, I, Somebody said to me the other day um, about uh, who was it we had on? Oh, Bob Sorge wrote Secrets of the Secret Place. It's a, it's a great book on intimacy with Jesus. Yeah. But um, they said, man, it's just amazing when you have a guest on that, that has been with the Lord, that has heard from the Lord. Like when they speak, it's like you can't get enough. And it's like, it, it, and I'm telling you, every time you you would talk, I was like, I, I just couldn't get enough. So I, I our guests are in for a real treat. I really, really appreciate your time today. You're very kind. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. All right. Until next time, guys, let's do this. Thanks. <laughs>